Hey everybody, welcome to this webinar. You have heard of Backstage. Perhaps you have even already set up a POC of your developer portal using Backstage. Now, the next crucial question is, how do I make my developers use it? I am your host, Jorge Le Fiesta, author of the Linux Foundation Introduction to Backstage, Certified Sommelier, and I work at Rodi.io, Backstage as a Service. And to address the present topic of adoption, I have here with me two experts who have succeeded at widespread their backstage instance within their organization. First up, we have Kaspar Nissen, a CNCF ambassador in the Nordics and lead platform architect at Lunar Bank. Welcome, Kaspar. Thank you. Uh, how long have you been using backstage? Uh, I think we've been using backstage uh, almost since the beginning. Uh, so when we first saw the video coming out on, from Spotify, we more or less instantly started adopting. So that would be almost three years uh, to the date now. Excellent. Uh, next up, we have Michael Pang, project manager at Relativity in the team that is in charge of the backstage instead. Welcome, Michael. Hey, thank you for having us. Thank you. How long have you been using backstage? Um, we've been using Backstage for about a year. Uh, we've been uh, uh, we've been seeing it on a lot of uh, you know uh, uh, circling the internet, uh, circling uh, developer experience uh, conferences, and you know it's one of the things that we wanted to to try and tackle ourselves with a large engineering organization. So, been leveraging uh, Rody for about almost a year now, um, and it's been it's been great. It's been a great journey. Excellent. Now we know each other, so let's get into the topic. So let's get started with uh, how many developers are using your backstage-based developer portal right now? So yeah, I, I can go ahead uh, and start. Uh, so right now I, we are uh, approximately 120 full-time uh, developers at Lunar, and I would say all of them uses uh, uh, backstage. Um, I just had a look at our Google Analytics uh, from the past uh, couple of months, and I see that we have around 60 unique users every week. So it's uh, er uh, everybody is, is sort of getting in there uh, from time to time, depending on, of course, what tasks they have. But uh, we'll come back to that later. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, uh, on our side, um, I, I think I've seen about 100 unique users week over week um, with about almost, I think we're approaching like 400 total uh, contributing users uh, in our in our backstage instance. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, we're, we're trying to get more, uh, get more usage out of it, um, but trying to prove out those those use cases where teams are finding and valuable, um, and organically kind of get them in there uh, day after day. So, uh, like I said, it's a journey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. That, that's our really impressive numbers. You, you've come, you've come quite some way across. Uh, the next question I have is, why do developers go to your developer portal today? Should I go ahead and start out first again, or do you want to? Yeah, I can, I can, I can take this one. Um, so, so we've kind of seen usage vary across, you know, team to team, uh, depending on, um, you know, how they want to use it and 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 uh, leverage backstage. Um, uh, what what I've uh, kind of seen is teams that have been more regularly using it le really like to leverage the tech docs functionality, um, and having their docs live alongside the code as well as you know the workflows that that live alongside with it and in the in the in the code itself. It makes managing it uh, a lot easier having it every everything in one place, um, and then of course the the tech talk renders you know nicely in in backstage, and then that content is, is searchable. Um, we we typically you know pre, uh, had a lot of our documentation stored in Confluence, um, and that information can get outdated very quickly. You know people you know either copy something, slightly modify it, um, and then someone you know later down the road comes searching for that document which has the same title. Um, all those things can add to cognitive load because they aren't sure which one <laughs> they should be reading. Um, even uh, you know is, is this document the right one or is that one the, uh, the right one um, and then you're kind of looking at like when was it last edited um, <laughs> so there, there's really no good uh, there was no really great place to really understand what, where is the formalized documentation for the systems that I, I'm looking for information for and, and backstage is a really good way to kind of make that that uh, formalized documentation live um, and then an, another kind of use case that I've really seen um, 
people get excited about uh, when we show them off backstage uh, and generate a lot of excitement is uh, uh, software templates. And I can probably get into that, that afterwards, but um, we've definitely seen a lot of kind of interest in uh, software templates at, at our organization. Yeah, I can, I can definitely relate to the uh, to, to to documentation and conference being uh, like a pain for developers. Uh, just having it decoupled from where you work, um, not having your standard tools available, not being able to write in Markdown or whatever you prefer as a developer is has been a really big pain. We before we found Backstage, we searched for Markdown documentation pages. We were also on conference and, and didn't really find the good. A solution until we saw backstage we, that that was one of the selling points of our adoption is that now we can actually uh, co-locate everything within the repository so that we can provide a really nice uh, developer workflow so that they don't have to go into multiple different places they can just sit in the git repository and do whatever they need to do write their code write their documentation and everything should be centered around that repository uh, so that was at least one of the the reasons for why we we adopted the uh, backstage in in the beginning um, we've also, um, have a lot of developers visiting our backstage installation due to the fact that we've been building a lot of uh, plugins ourselves. Uh, it's actually been like a, an inner sourcing movement within Lunar. Uh, so it's actually one of the, the two most uh, used plugins is actually something that's not coming out of the, the centralized uh, platform team. It's more developers that saw a need for creating a plugin that solved a particular problem. Uh, one of these problems was uh, uh, they needed a, a front end uh, for doing reconstitutions. So whenever a new service uh, needed to be spun up and uh, needed to get uh, events from a certain time in order to populate its uh, new database or whatever. Uh, so we actually had a, a squad that built out a, a plugin for, for doing reconstitutions uh, to our Rabbit installation. Um, which is now being used widely at, at Lunar. We also have a, a dead lettered uh, plugin that basically developers use to handle whenever a, a message is not, or an event is not able to be delivered to some service for some reason. It ends up in this queue that developers can then inspect, figure out what is wrong and resend the events if, if that's the, is what they want to do or just discard them. So getting a UI for some of the things that are really critical to to our developers uh, workflows um, has been one of the ways we sort of get a lot of developers in there because now they prefer to do it using uh, this ui that's now been built so that's at least uh, two of the things and uh, maybe uh, uh, <laughs> you can con con continue on the uh, the scaffolder and, and and the templates because that's also a thing that i can uh, comment on afterwards then <laughs> because we also use that a lot yeah yeah. <laughs> um I, yeah it, it, and and like when we show off our the the kind of like the first template that we built especially to like the platform teams that are building kind of like the foundations and the tools that other engineering teams use um you can you can really see start seeing the wheel spinning um like oh how could i use this Ooh, like i have this workflow that um, and, and so like as an example, we had a process that was taking engineering teams about six to eight weeks uh, to build a new microservice without even being able to work like on the actual business logic of their service. This was just a process that kind of involved you know, multiple tickets to different teams, manually creating resources in certain places, getting you know, that repo set up with that, that boilerplate code and setting up your CI CD workflows, security and compliance stuff. All these things took time, and each one of them had a you know a chunk of lead time that added up. Uh, whether it was in like you know planning sessions or refinements, um, all of these things had a different kind of onboarding document they needed to read. They needed to familiarize themselves with. Um, they needed to interact with a different team if there was questions that were open. They had to conduct a spike, um, a whole host of things. Uh, and then on top of all of that, there's a number of manual steps you had to go through. And then, you know, there's a chance that you miss one of those steps. Um, all of that adds up uh, and you multiply that across, you know, uh, 50, 60, 70 engineering teams that are that are going through the process. Um, and it was really slowing us down. Um, and so what we essentially did is we looked at that entire process and identified where are all of these manual steps? What are each step that these developers have to go through in that process. 
and what can we automate away? What can we eliminate? What can we abstract away and bundle it into that template? And so now all they have to do is enter in those handful of parameters that we've defined um, that are that are important and critical to to spinning up that service. And now something that took six to eight weeks, um, they can have a, a microservice kind of endpoint live, uh, like that hello world endpoint live within like 15 minutes, right? And so that that process is much more uh, simplified. There's, you know, obviously things that we're still working through and, and we're, we're learning uh, the best way to kind of manage it. But um, it, it's really like the first use case that was really eye-opening to, to the value that the developer portal can provide, especially with like a larger engineering organization. There's a lot of complexities that you have to deal with compliance regulations, those kinds of things. Uh, um, and, and so it just manage, balancing all that and, and simplifying it is really a huge benefit to those developers because there's so much complexity that they have to like navigate on a daily basis. And if you can make that a lot simpler for them um, and, and give them a lot of that tooling out of the box so they can focus on you know, building out that new feature for the customer. Um, and, and reinvest that time and whether it's learning opportunities, you know, different, you know, hygiene, uh, code hygiene, uh, documentation, making sure that it, you're having your uh, documentation well well thought out. Those kinds of things was usually an afterthought, right? It's usually something that comes after you, <laughs> you get everything done and you got to move quickly. Um, but now that time can be reinvested in those areas, which is, which is amazing. And I, I think that it'll ultimately improve our ability to operate efficiently within the, within the company. So um, yeah, that was like the first thing that uh, was really kind of eye-opening to the, to the value that the developer portal can provide. Yeah, we, I, I can definitely relate to that as well. Um, we, we've also been been using uh, the scaffold and all the templates for for quite a while now, and and all the things you mentioned is is also what we have been seeing. That we we also had like a, a, a process that required a lot of manual steps. Uh, you need to create a Docker registry here. You need to go in and do this and this and this in order to get a database and all those things. Now it's uh, it's a matter of filling out a form of I think it's five steps or something, five fields you need to put in some some stuff. And we get a lot of data using GitHub as well to sort of fetch what teams are available, what domains is, is out there, because we have centralized uh, everything on uh, what domains exist in our microservice infrastructure and all that. You can just select that from the drop-down box and press, <laughs> yeah, press <laughs> create, a <button>. <laughs> yeah, press a button, and then you get a repository. You can we even build something where you can basically um, uh, cl click a box that say, do we want to have your service deployed directly to production? And you can click that box. And, and if you do that and you create a repository, like you also said, like a, a, a simple application will be built, it will be released, and you will have a, an endpoint, a ping on endpoint in our case, ready to, to go. Mm -hmm. So for, for, for a developer, that means that everything is just set up for them. Everything is ready. They are Everything is instrumented. The repo is configured uh, using best practices. It's compliant. We enforce, uh, you know, review branch protection. We enforce signed commits. All of those things are just set up from the get-go. So developers don't have to think about any of those things. Uh, it's it's just start coding and solve the problem that you mm -hmm. uh, need to solve in order to uh, yeah fulfill the the business values of uh, whatever you're doing. Um, we also seen uh, so so we started out very simple a microservice uh, uh, setup using a template, but now we have fifteen or something different templates. So we have docs templates, we have CLI templates, we have microservices templates. We even have we use uh, a, a robot framework to automate some tasks in old systems. So we even have like a, a template for how you create a, a robot uh, to actually you know press buttons in in in, in these old systems. Um, so all of that is, is configured and, and is basically being handled for you. So you will get a compliance setup. And now we come to the point where we are able to shut down uh, auto, you know, creation of repositories within GitHub. So everything is controlled through backstage. So developers cannot don't have the right to create a repository directly in GitHub anymore. That is completely controlled through the process that we enforce using using backstage, which is uh, super nice as a financial service institution that we can uh, you know, check those boxes and, and say we are now compliant in, in this regard as well. Mm -hmm. 
Um, we also use Tech Insights uh, to to sort of provide some some features on or some some insights for developers into are we actually following the right processes? Is things configured as it's supposed to? So you sort of get you know the green check mark. Everything looks good. Uh, I'm good to go. Um, we also have like uh, squad pages. Uh, so every team has like a page that sort of provide the most interesting stuff for them. Uh, usually that consists of uh, the, pull, the, the GitHub uh, pull request uh, plugin, which is pretty nice. So they get that from the entire squad. So they, that's that's what's relevant to them. But also if they have their letter messages uh, for some of the services, or if they're missing to uh, set a domain, for example, on particular services or whatever it might be, we just you know surface all the important stuff on the overview page uh, or the team page so they actually use that in in the daily work um which is nice and and the last thing that we sort of uh, seen uh, when you get this uh, software or catalog and everything up and running we also have a lot of other stakeholders now using backstage for for other things um it's not only developers anymore we have a lot of architects we have the businesses also really using this because now we have the software catalog that is our asset management catalog that is where we sort of demonstrate or show auditors that this is our uh, uh, yeah our assets basically our software assets uh, this is the criticality that this domain has which means that uh, if something goes wrong it's on call that will be triggered so all of these things are sort of being uh, visualized and, and also uh, used in backstage to also tell that story to, to other stakeholders than just developers. Um, so that's that's pretty nice that we now have this central place where we can get all of that information and surface it to the different stakeholders that are using the systems. That's certainly quite impressive. You've gone a long way uh, to be able to stop the what you mentioned about developers not being able to create repositories directly on GitHub, I think that's really powerful because then it means that you have already centralized, as you said, the, the processes and everything they need to be productive and it's under your control. That's really great. Uh, yeah, that, that you, you, you've already gotten into the question that I was going to ask <laughs> and that's great because it's about uh, how did you widespread backstage across your organization? Because now that you have uh, these features, uh, it is evident for developers that they get a lot of value to get to your portal and they, they have to do it. Well, in, in, in the case of, uh, Gaspa, they don't have a choice. They have to go <laughs> to the portal, but in the earlier stages, how did you convince people to, to start using it or what, 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 how was the beginning? Like, because now it's like really a great picture and both of you have scaffolder templates that are really calling people in. Uh, what was the process for onboarding entities or, or all this like more kind of tedious work that happens in the beginning? Uh, I, I can uh, I can maybe start out because I, we we spend a lot of time discussing. We we really don't want to put any work on our developers. This is something that we should provide out of the box for them. We don't. So in, at least uh, in, the, in the beginning, it was like you need to take this uh, GitHub URL, you need to add this thing into the to uh, to backstage and, and all that. Uh, we, we didn't want to deal with any of that. Developers shouldn't uh, it, this, they shouldn't care about that at all. That that is something that should just work out of the box. We spend a lot of time in um, on actually building all the processing and, and all of that. Uh, so right now we are uh, we, we were kind of lucky because a couple of years before adopting Backstage, we, we built uh, something that we call Shuttle, which is basically a, a file that lives in all our repositories that, uh, amongst others, defines ownership, uh, which team this is, what is the name of the service. It also def uh, defines uh, how does the service look in different environments. So we could fairly easily create a preprocessor that read this file and created all the Backstage uh, components uh, based on this file. So we were able to fairly quickly get all of our uh, GitHub uh, repositories in there and, and then basically starting adding small, more and more stuff to this file so that we will be able to put on yeah, domains or whatever it, it might be. Um, so we are utilizing our old tooling uh, to instrument and, and ensure that we get all of the data uh, in Backstage. Uh, so whenever you create a repository, it's in Backstage within five minutes and everything is automated, nothing needs to be added uh, by hand. 
uh, which I think was a if if we force developers to to do like a copy paste uh, insert, you need to have this backstage component in your repo. We wouldn't have succeeded uh, at all. Yeah, I think, and, uh, yeah, making it I, easy is, is important. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, at the end of the day, we ask developers and team those teams to do a lot of different things. Um, especially, I'm assuming with tech insights, right? But it's, there's this always like you're playing catch up all the time, you know, whether it's a migration or an upgrade. Um, and that's something that we were trying to balance too. It's like, do we take a heavy handed approach or do we take a more, you know, soft approach where we prove up the value and have people organically come into backstage. And we, we've kind of tried both right now. Um, and I, I've kind of seen more excitement around, you know, the, the, like I said, the software templates, the part where we're proving out like the, the, the value that it can provide. And that's really getting people excited about it. Um, and, and so like our, our first approach was uh, we, we have a very complex kind of technical ecosystem internally and ownership was something we were trying to juggle. Um, it wasn't entirely clear who owned what. Um, and so our adoption journey really started off with uh, the software catalog and what we decided to do is couple that with um, the ability to begin tracking your Dora metrics and the way that you could identify your, um, you as the owner of a service that was sending, you know, your build and deploy events that were being calculated into a Dora metrics was to register those components into the software catalog. Um, and so that was kind of like our approach to getting people into the software catalog and onboarding their services in there. Um, and we started to see some fidelity behind our, our ecosystem, um, and what teams own, what teams are being, what components uh, within relativity are being actively developed. And that was like, uh, our, our first uh, kind of attempt there. And then we started to see some organic usage of like tech docs. People were like, oh, this is interesting. This is cool. Um, let me check this out. Um, maybe we'll move our documentation over from, you know, uh, Confluence into here. Um, the more formalized documentation, the stuff that we want people to see, um, not necessarily, you know, like the spike pages and stuff. Um, but yeah, that was like, uh, we kind of seen an extension of a use case uh, that, that we first kind of uh, started out with. Um, we're, and we're really trying to close the gap on both sides, like the old stuff that was uh, pre-backstage and the new stuff that, that we want to kind of like start out in backstage. And I think that's uh, similar to kind of like what Casper and, 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 and his, his, his org are doing is that they're, they want every, they having, or having pe guide people through backstages like that, that starting point. Um, and that's what we're trying to do as well. And we're starting to see kind of like a shift in teams thinking about uh, how they can offer more self-service workflows and, and backstage can almost like provide that front door to that experience for them. And, um, you know, integrating those tools in those templates so you get it out of the box. Um, so you, they don't even have to like think about you know, catching up the moment that they build a new service, they're already behind uh, because some new tool is available or some new version is available. Um, we want to make it easy for them to not even have to think about that and they can get it out of the box. Um, and then, you know, uh, <clears throat> I think uh, it's, it's uh, our way of effectively trying to stop the bleeding, so to speak. And, and over time, those systems that were built before Backstage will eventually, you know, make their way in uh, over time. Because we don't want to say, you know, we need to do this today because we're, we're all moving fast. We're all super busy. Uh, <laughs> we, we don't want to. We don't want to uh, overburden teams with with this work, and you know, uh, I think that ultimately makes developers happy when they can focus on the stuff that they want to focus on. And over time, they will begin to organically get their stuff in there. So we've we've kind of tried both uh, both approaches, um, and, and we're still trying to figure it out. But definitely, I would say like the the approach with the templates, especially if you have a lot of complex workflows, is a is a good route to take. Um, to, to show the value um, that, that it can provide. Yeah. All right. Great. Uh, great discussion today. Thank you so much for coming. I'm afraid we are running out of time, but I think you were very generous during your insights and from your experience. Uh, do you guys have any closing or mention before we wrap it up? Um, it, maybe if, if you are around at KubeCon, uh, I have a talk on, on Friday, I think right after you, uh, maybe. Um, exactly, and the so, same room, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so 11.55 uh, Friday at KubeCon, uh, come see me if you are there. Um, 
Yeah, and and I would say if you're thinking about adopting backstage, um, do it. <laughs> uh, do try out a POC. Um, I think it's like one of the the best things that can you know improve your developers day to day. So um, if if you're thinking about if, if this has been a discussion uh, with your with your teams, definitely look into get it into a hackathon. Get it in get it in front of people that make those decisions, um, and and you know prove out that that value. I think it's. It, I think you'll be have a happier engineering organization overall once you once you go down the journey. Um, but yeah, excellent. All right, thank you guys. Um, for everybody going to KubeCon Amsterdam, uh, I'll see you there. Awesome. Thank time. you. <laughs> thank Bye. you. Bye.